Welcome back to the Institute of East Asia Training. This time we're talking about the issue of drug therapy for depression and anxiety. And we'll say maybe a little bit about anxiety and grief as we go. Let me have a prayer with you and we'll get right into it. Our Father in heaven, I'm asking you to bless us as we talk about what is right and best. Teach us how to go forward, the best way to improve our mood and our happiness. And I ask for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So you've seen now in the last few days three videos uh, where Dr. Neil Nedley was given so much information about neurotransmitters, about the things we can do to increase serotonin and uh, delivery, how to deal with uh, other hormones in the mind. Uh, that information is golden. But you should know that like gold in real life, it's not commonly known that most of the doctors, uh, most of the psychiatrists, most of the psychologists that are living probably near you, if you presented yourself to them with a case of depression, uh, they would ask you some questions. They would try to diagnose whether you had a clinical case of depression, whether it was severe depression. And then they'd be very likely to prescribe for you some form of of antidepressant drug. Some of the most common drugs would be the SSRIs, that is the Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. Or they might uh, uh, prescribe some that aren't so selective. Selective, I mean, serotonin and nor epinephrine uptake, reuptake inhibitors. And there are others. Quite a number of uh, drugs are used to to regulate or to try to affect mood. And uh, these two ideas, using drugs to improve mood and using cognitive behavioral therapy to improve mood, are as far from each other as the East is from the West. Maybe I should explain that for some of you. Cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive, meaning having to do with the thoughts. Behavioral having to do with what you do, your actions, your lifestyle, your choices of how you live, therapy, how you get treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy, treating depression by changing people's actions and their ideas, helping people with anxiety by treating their, by changing their ideas and changing their habits. That's what Dr. Neil Nedley is doing in his depression recovery program. That's what you'll be doing when you're helping your friends recover from their depression and anxiety. That's when you're doing biblical counseling. When we go right to the Bible and its promises about having a peace, real peace. But we're trying to change their ideas. The Bible teaching about peace that comes from knowing God is cognitive therapy. It's changing the ideas in a way to bring healing, to bring peace. And when you read that in Isaiah 57, 19, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There you see a, a cause of anxiety, a wickedness. Sin is a cause of anxiety. So while the Bible has much to say related to our thoughts and our actions, it doesn't have a lot to say about drugs. And I, what I want to do today is give an overview of some of the most common types of uh, drug prescri prescribing related to depression and tell you why I don't recommend the use of these drugs. Maybe first, the big picture. The big picture is that people have been trying to fight depression with medications for a long time. My mother, uh, Vivian, she passed away this last November, but when... When I was born, my mom was so excited. She said her times of being pregnant were the happiest times of her life. And when I was born, she stayed happy. And, and it wasn't much longer, another year and a half, my brother Michael was born. Mom was so happy to have us. But my dad had been, uh, he had been married before he married my mother and he'd had four children by his first wife. And so that made me number five, and that made my brother number six. 
And for my dad, that was enough children. He didn't want more than six. So while my mother was uh, uh, not in her proper thinking mode uh, related to the birth of my brother, at my dad's urging, the doctor put a form in front of my mother and asked her to consent to a hysterectomy. Well, you know, to make it impossible for her to have more children. My mother did not want to sign that document. But in the pressure of the moment and a strong-willed doctor, she did. And they wheeled her in for a surgery. And my mother took hormones for the rest of her life until she was 82 years old. So that's 50 years of taking hormones. She took hormones as a way of stabilizing her, her mood. And she took other antidepressants also, quite a number of them. Drug medication for depression is so common. Uh, I read today that in the United States, about one in six ladies are taking or have taken uh, drugs for depression, and about one in 12 men. That is a huge market, That's so much so. And uh, let me describe for you how the most common antidepressants are supposed to work, and then compare that way of working with what you already know from what you've seen. So maybe you already know from listening to Neil that serotonin plays a big part in how you feel uh, calm, your feeling of general happiness. Uh, this comes in the back part of your brain largely from serotonin. Dopamine has more to do with the front part of your brain, that feeling of exhilaration. But serotonin, more the, the center and the back of the brain, that feeling of calm, restful, peaceful happiness. Serotonin comes that way. And scientists who are studying mood have known for quite some time about serotonin. <clears throat> serotonin. Only a small portion of your serotonin actually operates in your brain. Most of it operates in your gut or in your platelets or in uh, your uh, spleen. This is where you have maybe 90-some percent of your serotonin that's active in those parts of your body. Uh, even the serotonin that is used in your brain, when it's... Uh, done with its purpose there, much of it is absorbed into platelets of the blood and, and actually plays a part in clotting uh, when, you, when you cut yourself or you're scratched. So men who were looking for ways to take a potion that would cure depression got an idea that if they could increase the amount of serotonin in the brain, maybe they could increase the amount of happiness. And how do you do that? How do you increase the amount of serotonin? Well, the research showed that serotonin uh, is released uh, in the area of the synapses where you have uh, nerve connections. And uh, while the half-life of serotonin in your gut or in your platelets can be like a day, 15 to 20 hours, sometimes up to 40 hours, in the brain, serotonin has a, a much faster turnover, just a few minutes. And uh, what your mind does is it releases serotonin where it needs to. And then that serotonin is taken out of circulation. That's reuptake, taken out of circulation by uh, various receptors that are designed for that purpose. And why does your body take up? Uh, serotonin and norepinephrine and several other of these neurotransmitters, it takes them up because, first of all, they've done the work of stimulating the receptors. They don't have any more purpose there, but also they're recycled. 
your mind can recycle them and use that material again to produce more serotonin when you need it, where you need it. Your mind is just an incredible recycling system for neurotransmitters. This is the way you're designed to work. And what men found is that those uptake sites, the ones that take up the serotonin after it's done its work, those uptake sites, if you put in the right kind of drug, it can inhibit those sites from working. So if you could imagine, uh, here is a faucet that's spitting out serotonin to help your mood. It does that into the synapsis of the, um, between the nerves, uh, one nerve and another. And now these have done their duty. It's time to be reabsorbed. But now the reabsorption isn't working. And as a result, you end up having more serotonin right there, more than you would if some of it was taken up. And the theory of the drug, I, the drug creators was that by having more serotonin there in the synapses, you would have a better mood. And I'll tell you what worked and what didn't. What worked is that some of these drugs, like Paxil is one of them, Celexa is one of them, Luvox is one, Prozac is one, Zoloft is one, and some of these other ones are not familiar enough to to me, I'm not sure if I pronounced them correctly, but there's a lot of them. Uh, I mean, really, there's eight. But those eight uh, have maybe 40 different names. Uh, so maybe when you're given, when you're suggested to take some sort of medicine for your uh, mood, you might want to ask enough to find out if it's a uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Yeah, SSRI, check on it. Uh, what worked is that these things, within a matter of minutes, do inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. So within a matter of minutes, you do have more serotonin in your synapses. But what didn't work is that doesn't create a mood lift in those few minutes. And in fact, many people have found that they don't get any noticeable mood lift even for three, four, five, six weeks, which didn't make any sense at all when you consider the theory of how this drug was supposed to work. Like the question is, how is it working? If the effect comes in five weeks, but the drug has its impact in just a few minutes, that's a good question. So uh, when the research was initially done on these, it was done by, well, guess who? The drug companies. And the drug companies, whenever they're checking out a medicine, and maybe I should spend some minutes on this next idea because it's really important for you to understand about drugs. When they're evaluating a medicine, they need to take into account in their research the fact that your mind and body are so intimately connected. But what do I mean by intimately connected? I mean that you are, your mind and body are so connected that if I gave you, if you thought I was a doctor and a smart one, and I gave you a little pill that had just a little bit of salt and sugar in it with something, a little bit of nutrition maybe, and, uh, and I told you this is going to cure your depression, one in three of you, your depression would be improved by taking that meaningless pill. That's called placebo. Placebo. P-L-A-C-E-B-O. I'm not good at spelling. I hope I got that right. But placebo is so powerful that literally one-third of people thinking they're getting medication for their depression are going to be helped by it. You know, 30%. That's a lot. But what the drug companies said when they did their studies is that three-quarters, almost 70%, of the people who would take these SSRIs would notice a change or a help in their mood. Three quarters of them.
And so that's a significant difference. That's a lot of people. And so many people have been put on these medications. So many. But what came out in the news just a few years ago, so interesting, is someone began to doubt that research. And when they redid studies on persons that have middle-level cases or low-level cases or middle-high-level cases of depression, they found that while 3 in 10 are benefited by placebo, 4 in 10 are benefited by SSRIs. Now think that through. 4 in 10 are, four in, 3 in 10 who get nothing say, I feel better, and 4 in 10 that get the medicine say, I feel better. Well, how many of these 4 in 10 are being benefited by placebo effect? Well, obviously that's going to be 3 of them. So what you have is, 3 in 10 are benefited by thinking they're getting better, and 1 in 10 are benefited by the SSRI. If that math didn't make sense to you, let me try to say it one more time to you. If 4 in 10 benefit from the SSRI, that benefit is a mix. Part of it comes from the drug, and part of it comes from the hopefulness of the patient, thinking, I'm going to get better. Well, how much comes from the hopefulness? We can learn that by looking at what the placebo did. The placebo helped 3 in 10. So put that in, and now we see there's 1 in 10 left. Or to say it another way, if 3 in 10 are helped by placebo, then 7 in 10 are not. And how many of that 7 in 10 are helped by the SSRI, or noticeably have a change in mood? It's 1. About 1 in 7. Now, if you were a doctor and someone came to you that was depressed, would you prescribe them a drug that they could take for years and years that had a 1 in 7 chance of helping them? I don't know. It might depend on whether it has side effects. But these SSRIs have lots of side effects. You could guess some of them. Some of them have to do with, like, digestion and with uh, indigestion, really, and, and weight loss. And some weight gain, but weight loss is more common. And when you hear about that indigestion and weight loss, for some people who have depression, that might actually lead to some benefit. Maybe, maybe that's part of where that 1 in 7 is coming from. But headache, more anxiety, the list of side effects for these drugs are many. I wrote some down. Let me just read to you some of the ones I read. The most common side effects for SSRIs. That's feeling agitated feeling shaky or anxious, feeling sick, having indigestion or diarrhea, loss of appetite, weight loss, dizziness, blurred vision, dry mouth, excessive sweating, headaches, several sexual problems that I won't go into. Those were the common, and then less common but serious, some people have hallucinations. Some have... Uh, stiffness of muscles or shaking. Some have confusion. My experience with my own students who've been started taking some of these has been that those uncommon side effects were common. That is, a number of my students who took them had these what are called less common side effects. And uh, so I began looking into the topic, and uh, I'll present to you some of what I found. I found that it's not a mistake that our body takes up the serotonin that it is used. Serotonin is not a very stable molecule. It is broken up and recreated, remade. It tends to break down the body. You can find in Wikipedia an entire chain of the chemicals it breaks down into. I mean, quite, quite a list. But uh, the mind tends to take it, break it down, and remake serotonin to use at the right time in the right place. If you were in a city that had a really great uh, recycling system,
for producing its own glass bottles. And if you thought like this, that recycling glass bottles is somewhat a waste. If we just keep the glass bottles instead of putting them in recycling, then uh, we'll have more glass bottles around than it, even if we recycle them. But you see the problem with that is that sure, you would have more glass bottles, but you wouldn't have them where you need them, how you need them, in the best condition that you need them. The recycling of the glass bottles puts them into the bottling companies where they can fill them. I don't know with what. Probably you'd be better off without glass bottles, but maybe some whole fruit juice, grape juice for you, or apple juice or something. Mango juice usually isn't mango juice. It's uh, mango with sugar. But anyway, I'm trying to illustrate for you the problem with SSRIs or serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Would be, that would be SNRI, I think would be the abbreviation. These medications are interfering with a very efficient system that God created. And what's interesting is that CBT has a much greater effectual uh, success than 1 in 7 or 1 in 10. It helps the great majority of people. So here comes a patient to you, and she's already on Paxil, and uh, she tells it to you, and you're thinking, oh no, she is on an SSRI. What am I going to do? Well, be slow with what you do. First of all, that Paxil isn't increasing the production of serotonin for her. It's only leaving the serotonin hanging around wherever it is. So it's not really doing as much for her mood as she might think. In fact, the main thing helping her mood is the fact that she thinks the medicine is helping her. That's three quarters of the SSRI benefit comes from the placebo effect. Three quarters of it, that's a pretty, a pretty big part of it. Uh, but what you can do for her is teach her behaviors and thought patterns that will literally produce more serotonin at the right time in the right place, uh, produced right there where it's needed to help with the transmitting of messages in between your nerves. Those neurotransmitters, that's what they're doing, such important parts of our brain. Well, I wrote a lot of notes for myself, and let's see what I can help you with here. First of all, when you teach yourself about these kind of drugs, it puts you at a little handicap. It means many of these words, I've never heard anyone say them. And that means I might say them really wrong. So if you want to look them up and ask Google how to, Google how to say them, all you have to do is look up the SSRIs and you'll find the same list I found and, and Google can tell you how to say them. But I'm going to just try to say them to you. The one most commonly called Celexa is also Ciprimalil <laughs> and Citaopram. I think I have some doctors who are listening to this who are probably going to just be laughing. They're probably going to get actually endorphins just by listening to me try to say these words. So that was one. Citalopram is one of them, and it has a couple other names, Cipropril and Celexa. Then there's Depoxetina. <laughs> Sepoxetine, maybe that's how you say it. And uh, that one is sometimes called Prilixi. I might regret even trying this. Then there's Exitilapium, and uh, that's sometimes called Saprilex, but Lexapro is the one I've heard before. I, I'm more happy seeing that word. Those are all those three, Lexapro, Ciprolex, and Exitilapram are the same uh, SSRI. Then there's Fluoxetine, which is usually called Prozac or Oxetin. I think Prozac is one of the most prescribed drugs in North America. 
lots of young people, children in school are put on it when the real thing they need is to get off TV. Then fluvoxamine, which is sometimes called Paxil, or, uh, oh wait, no, no, it's not. I, I drew my lawns wrong. Fluvoxamine is sometimes called a Luvox, or Ferrarin, and then Paroxetine is sometimes called Seroxat, or Paxil, or Paxil CR, whatever that stands for. You know, there's more of these. I'm just not going to read them all because I think I'm just, I'm just destroying these words, and uh, the, it's not worth it for the entertainment value for those who know how to say them. This collection of medicines all put together, when I began to research them two years ago, I found that no one really knows how they're working. I mean, I told you the theory. They're leading to more serotonin right there not being taken up. But when, but because of the delay between when that happens and when the feeling comes, uh, that delay is itself the most incredible, mysterious part of the whole thing. It makes it sound like there's something else going on. Maybe the, maybe if I would just suggest, it might even be a greater a self-produced effect. I mean, that maybe if you take a drug that doesn't have any real value, that will help 3 in 10. But maybe if you take one of these SSRIs, the body erects and not, uh, reacts because it knows something is happening. And if something is happening, maybe it's real medicine. And if it's real medicine, then maybe you get even more of that effect. Maybe that's why it's 4 in 10 instead of 3 in 10. Hey, I don't know. And when I say I don't know, don't think this is putting me in a bad category. I mean, the lead researchers I was studying, no one really knows. But what happened when that research showed that only 4 in 10 are being benefited is that uh, JAMA, J-A-M-A, the journal, well, I don't know, probably American Medicine Medical Association. I didn't even look up to see what it stands for, but it's one of the most respected journals in medicine. That journal stopped accepting uh, studies from Big Pharma on these SSRIs. They said, we're not going to take any more. After you m mishandled the data, and uh, one of the ideas of how that data was mishandled is maybe they tried these SSRIs on people who were the most severely depressed. That is, people have cycles of depression. And if you catch someone at the very deepest level of depression, maybe you're going to be able to help a lot more of them by retaining some more of that serotonin for a while, maybe something else. Anyway, quite generally, people who have the most problems will have the, the most gain from any sort of medication. And, uh, yeah, that's true. So I was in the hospital with my mother back in November, and I was talking to the nurses there, and I asked one of the nurses, do you think the SSRIs are a blessing or a curse? And oh, her answer to me was very fast. She said, a blessing. Since she had been taking it, she had been doing so much better. And she had prescribed it to many of her patients. Oh, she was a charge nurse for that whole ward, and I really didn't want to uh, argue with her. But if I'd had a real chance to talk to her more on a one-to-one -one basis, I would have suggested to her that the benefits that the people are receiving might not have as much to do with serotonin uptake as she thinks. And uh, how can you really do anything that will produce more, more serotonin? Well, I hope you're ready to answer that question because that was the point of Dr. Nedley's lectures that you've been watching for some time already. If you want to find some of the studies that I was doing, one of the most interesting ones, and this is about the half-life of serotonin in various tissues, it's by Sidney Underfriend, 
and Herbert Whistlebach. And uh, yeah, I think if, if you try to find that, you'll find it. Uh, what I learned about this very short half-life in the brain, I realized that this means that that molecule breaks down quite quickly. And it looks to me like if it breaks down quickly, that if the brain doesn't take it up quickly, it's going to have a lower quality of serotonin, a lower quality of serotonin material there in the synapses. As it breaks down, it's not even really serotonin any longer. So no wonder your brain wants to pick that up, put it through the recycled bin, and spit it out as something useful. Well, one thing, when you're taking these, uh, these SSRIs or SN our eyes, you're going to be told to be careful not to get off them quickly. And I don't want to say, yes, just stop taking it. Because there is a black box warning on these drugs here in this country. That's the most serious type of warning you can put on medication. And that black box warning is about an increased suicide tendency uh, to those who are taking or those who stop taking the medication. It's both ways. These are pretty serious medications. So what I would say is while you wean yourself off of SSRIs, watching yourself for symptoms, be getting your exercise, watch your sleep, regulate your sugar, control your thoughts, control the timing of the use of your phone, you know, those hits that you've been hearing about. Do something to literally affect the melatonin, serotonin, tryptophan uh, levels in your body. Eat those foods that are going to have the necessary elements. And uh, when I'm thinking of the foods, not all the foods listed in those videos are widely available in poor countries where some of you are watching these. But I think if you will do some of your own research, you'll find tryptophan is not a rare, it's not rare at all. In fact, a lot of it is in the most common grains used in the world. And if you will do some searching, you can find common foods even in your area, inexpensive foods that have plenty of tryptophan. So you get that basic nutrient in there with the sleep and with the exercise to produce a much better effect. Well, now uh, let's talk a little bit about, about grief and about anxiety from the Bible, because this class is, of course, biblical counseling. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is talking about death, and it speaks specifically to this issue. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Do you hear something in that verse? There are two types of sorrow. There's sorrow with hope, and there's hopeless sorrow. In English, we tend to have a word for hopeless sorrow, and that is despair. So it's as if the verse says in 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, I'm sorry, verse 13, concerning those which have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who despair. God saves us from despair by a belief in the fact that Jesus died and rose again. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him, that is, bring up with him from the grave, those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means prevent, precede, is what it says in New King James, even better, precede those which are asleep. 
for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus shall we ever, ever always be with the Lord. Listen to verse 18. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Here you have some ideas about how to help people with grief. And one of those ideas is to help them with a true conception of death and resurrection. Knowing that death is asleep really reduces anxiety with the grieving person. Because if you think of your mother being in heaven watching down and seeing you with the mistakes you're making, for many people that would cause anxious care. And, um, yeah, grief. Satan takes advantage of grief. And this is one reason why we want to get this message out about, about what happens when you die, is because we really leave our counselees open to deception from spiritualism if we don't teach them the truth about the nature of man, the nature of the soul, about death as a sleep. When you're looking at the stories of grief in the Bible, there are a few of them that might come to your mind. One of them is the story of David. David, uh, with his sin with Bathsheba, of course, she became pregnant. The baby was born, and God caused that baby to get sick, a sickness where the baby died. What you see there is that David grieved terribly while the baby was living. But when the baby died... He rose up and he washed his face and changed his clothes. And it was quite a mystery. I don't think that was like the way people grieved back in that day. No, it was just a complete mystery to the people around him. They had never seen grieving like that. But it gives you an idea of one of the important steps in grief. And that is accepting the unchangeable nature of death. The fact that we're not going to get so and so back. I was planting a church in uh, Arkadelphia, Arkansas, a number of years ago. And uh, one of my students, I won't tell you his name, but he's a missionary now in a country that's hard to work in. Uh, one of my students uh, came to me and told me that just after we buried one of our contacts, one of our contacts committed suicide. And uh, that story, maybe I should even tell you that story sometime. I mean, he had severe depression related to uh, the crimes of his life and the unforgiveness of his family. Anyway, that young man killed himself, and my student went over to the grave the day after he was buried and prayed that God would resurrect him. And maybe you could guess without me telling you, but nothing happened. Resurrection by the prayer of a, a godly person is not the standard way that God resolves death. Typically, people stay in the grave until the resurrection. That's the normal thing. And so when someone close to me dies or someone close to you, we can learn from David that we can grieve. If they're dying slowly, we can grieve the loss of them even while death is stealing over them while life is slipping away. And maybe there won't be so much grieving to do after they die and we can accept. Now, in the case of myself, when my uh, mother died, that was quite shocking. I had just a few days. So, of course, I had to grieve for days and for weeks. And uh, then five months later, our baby uh, was born, stillborn. And I grieved over that for weeks, lots of tears. But accepting the reality of death is a part of the grieving process. When we talk about grieving, it's important to realize that the ability to cope with death increases over time. So later in the semester, we're going to talk about post-traumatic stress disorder. I was talking to a doctor in a uh, Somalia yesterday who has suffered post-traumatic stress disorder. 
several of his close friends have been killed there. And uh, one of them for treating people who were wounded during the Civil War. And the doctor was killed for treating someone because it was viewed that he was working for the enemy since she was treating an enemy. When children experience the loss of a parent or a sibling, often they do not have the skills to cope with the grief so that grieving for a child is a different business than grieving for an adult. And uh, it may even come quite a bit later. Uh, if you marry someone who's gone through a process like that when they were in their, uh, when they're five or six years old, maybe by the time they're in their early 20s, they'll start dealing with that grief. And uh, that can mean for some of you when you get married that a person could go through a big change in their early 20s just over this, over the mind finally bringing up and dealing with issues that it couldn't cope with reasonably or well before. So the Bible, uh, when it talks about grief, it brings out that there's going to be a time when there'll be no more death, no more, no more sorrow, no more crying, when God has promised that he himself will wipe the tears away from our eyes. These verses weren't made just for, uh, for a theoretical way to answer trivia questions. They're related quite directly to how Christians, believers, cope with loss. Let me review the things I've said, and then I'll uh, leave you until we talk more about these things tomorrow. How is it that we should deal with depression and anxiety? CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, that's one word that takes in a whole host of counseling opportunities, telling people how to live, how to think. Then you have SSRIs and SNRIs and... Uh, other types of uh, drugs that I haven't even mentioned. I did make a list of them, but all of those drugs are playing with brain chemistry, playing with brain chemistry, but in a way where, where even if you compare it to placebo, it's not doing a lot better than placebo. The reason the SSRIs became so popular is because even though they have many uh, unpleasant side effects, their unpleasant side effects are smaller than the drugs that preceded them. And uh, those drugs that preceded them typically are not used today until you fail to get benefit from an SSRI, which really would mean that you failed to get benefit from placebo. Because, uh, anyway, you understand what I'm saying. So if you're on an SSRI today, probably a good number of you are, Maybe find another doctor and talk to him about CBT, if you can find one that is familiar with that, that type of program. Or maybe study CBT yourself. Uh, maybe learn some things from the testimonies that we're, that we're going to go over that are in the book that I've made available to you. Those of you who have access to the book, you'll find many things there about anxiety and the stresses that come from habits of thinking. Fixing those habits of thinking increasing our confidence in God, uh, keeping the Spirit close to us, thinking about the long-range effects. There are so many ways that we can stabilize mood and bring a healing to the mind. There's one more thing I ought to mention from the reading I've been doing. Ladies have a whole nother set of mood stabilizing issues related to the menstrual cycle. And uh, I have an idea that men shouldn't even make themselves experts on this topic, but I was doing plenty of reading on it this morning. And uh, I was reading it because I was trying to find out why did the doctor put my mother on hormones for 50 years? I noticed that they affected my mother in such a way 
that it became quite hard for her to cry. Where before she had been easy to cry, it became almost impossible to cry. And yet when I read her letters, it looked like that she had some very strong pent-up feelings of worthlessness and, and trouble. And uh, so I was doing research on that. And it just looks to me from the experiences my wife has had and the things that we've gone through, like, ladies, you want to be very careful how you approach hormone therapy for mood because it really isn't so that by having a certain amount of estrogen, you're going to have a good mood. Know that your body goes through levels and cycles of estrogen and that you could have a good mood at all levels of those hormonal levels. I mean, your mood could be stable while your estrogen is anything but stable. So trying to mess artificially with those hormone, hormones probably isn't a lot better than trying to mess with the reuptake of serotonin or of norepinephrine. And probably if we would go for other methods, we might find a much more successful way at regulating brain chemistry, that is by food, by exercise, by sleep, by thinking, by faith, by hope, by trust. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I ask that you'll bless us as we talk about this business of biblical counseling. Guide us well, we ask, in the name of Jesus. Amen.